Good morning. Let us hear the meditation verse and prepare our hearts for worship in a time of prayer. Our meditation verse comes from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3-5. through 5. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Welcome to the worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're worshiping this morning uh, through our live streaming uh, facilities and I want to welcome you all to our worship. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 150, verses 1 and 2. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent goodness. Let us sing a hymn of praise to our God. Hymn number 76, Praise my soul, the King of heaven.
Let us come to God in a prayer of adoration. Let us pray. Our God, to you belongs all praise. You are the Eternal One, the One who, by the power of your Word, brought all things into being. You gave all this universe its being. You created the stars, the earth, the heavens, the sky, the moon, the sun. You created life on this earth. You created us. Lord, we praise you that you are the God of love and faithfulness and truth, the God of justice, righteousness, and holiness. To you belongs all praise, and we praise you. And we, Lord, would come to worship you, worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, help us, for we are weak, and we need your power to worship you in a way that honors you. So bless us, we pray, by your Spirit. Help us in our worship this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth. For this we pray through the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Now we come to our uh, responsive reading. And we're reading from the Psalms. And we are on Psalm 105, I believe. I can get it before me. Uh, no, 124. Psalm 124. Let's read responsively. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side when people rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Amen. Our call to confession comes from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. There we read, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Let us come to God in a prayer of confession. Let's pray. Our Father, we do confess that we are weak and easily influenced by the world in which we live and the culture in which we have immersed, that we are immersed. And, and Lord, we, we need uh, to come to you and own up the truth that the culture does affect us and our own sin nature does plague us with evil and wicked desires, uh, with the desire to exalt ourselves, to be a, a law unto ourselves, and, and to please ourselves. Lord, forgive us, cleanse us. May we instead have a heart to please you, a heart to seek your glory and not our own, a heart to serve you and not ourselves, a heart to love our neighbor with your love. For you have loved us through the great work of the cross in giving your Son for our sins. We come confessing our sin and claiming the forgiveness we have in Christ in his shed blood for us. Cleanse us, we pray, and and renew us and make us fit for your worship and service. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Now let's sing a hymn of assurance. And can it be that I should gain? Hymn number 455. now we come this morning to the scripture reading from the New Testament from John the Gospel of John chapter 1 verses 43 through 51 this is God's Word the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee he found Philip and said to him follow me 
Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and, and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now let us go to a time of prayer and of thanksgiving and intercession. Let's pray. Our Father, we do praise and thank you for your blessing on, on us, our nation, our church, our families. We thank you. We do pray that you will continue to bless and keep those who are struggling with health issues and concerns. We ask your blessing on Sharon, on Tom, Delora, Artis. We pray for Terry's sister, Dottie, and nephew, Scott, for Rhonda's mother, Dolores, and for others, Lord, who are struggling with some illness or cancer. We ask that you will bless them and keep them and, and bring uh, comfort and healing to them. Lord, we ask that you will continue to, to bless our church, our session, deacons and staff, we thank you for them. We thank you for their, uh, their service to you. We ask your blessing. We pray for our government. We pray that you would bless our local officials here in our county, in the counties in which we live. We pray your blessing on our state. We pray your blessing on our nation. Lord, that there would be uh, the fear of Lord, the fear of you before their eyes, that there would be justice in our land and that we would be able to continue to freely speak about you and preach the gospel. Lord, we ask your blessing also on our missionaries whom we support. We remember Roberta in Japan and we praise you for how you are en enabled them to purchase their land for a parking place that they needed for their chapel. We pray that you would bless their Sunday English Bible study. We pray that you will continue to bless Roberta, that she may continue developing a deeper relationship with you and a freeness in sharing your love and your gospel with others. And we pray for your blessing on their community as they deal with the vi coronavirus and on their church. Lord, we also pray for Craig and Ree who are also serving in Japan, that you will continue to bless them. And we, we praise you that uh, Mr. N continues to attend worship. And we ask that as he does so by Zoom, he will be able to do so in person. And we ask also, Lord, that you will continue to bless those who have recently been baptized and ask that you will if, confirm them in their faith and cause them to grow in the knowledge of your Say our Savior, your Son, Jesus. And Lord, we, we ask that you will continue to bless the, the leadership team of their church and all the other uh, members as they deal with the issues uh, before them and that they will grow in their faith and in the knowledge of your Son. Lord, we, we pray especially for uh, our own uh, members who are in a special need at this time. We remember a Fay, and we thank you that she's growing stronger, but we pray that she would be free of the dependence on oxygen, that you will strengthen her lungs. We remember uh, 
Brenda and Phil as they are grieving the loss of Brenda's sister who recently passed away. We pray that you would bless them. We remember also that you, how you have uh, blessed Ken uh, who had open heart surgery recently and we ask that you will continue to heal him. Lord, bless those who serve in nursing homes and assisted living, and we ask that you will keep them safe from the virus and, and bless them and encourage them. Lord, we ask that you will bless our church and our officers as we consider how to serve you in these days. And we thank you for how you have guided us. Lord, we ask that you will continue to cause us to grow in our faith, grow in drawing close to you and, and, and depend on you for all things, giving praise to you and thanks in all things. Lord, that we would serve as a light uh, in our community by the way we live our lives and the way we, we trust and praise you. Lord, we thank you and ask your blessing now as we continue our worship, for we pray in your holy name. Amen. Let's join together in singing the doxology. Let's sing. Well, this morning uh, we're continuing in our study of the Gospel of Matthew. We are going through the Sermon on the Mount. And this week we come to a passage that has caused considerable confusion among Christians over the years. In this passage, Jesus says, Do not take an oath at all. There are some who have taught that this means that we are never to swear using God's name, even in a court of law, when we are required to affirm that we will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. As our confession teaches in chapter 22 on lawful oaths and vows, it says there, Yet, as in matters of weight and moment, an oath is warranted by the word of God, under the New Testament as well as under the Old. So a lawful oath being imposed by lawful authority in such matters ought to be taken. Some commentators, such as Leon Morris and William Hendrickson, have pointed out that even Jesus gave testimony under oath when he was put on trial before the Sanhedrin. The high priest put him under an oath when he said to Jesus in Matthew 26, verse 63, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus affirmed that this was true with a phrase used in his day to express such, such confirmation. He said, you have said so. And then went on to say in verse 64, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Well, this was all they needed to accuse Jesus of blasphemy in claiming to be equal to God. It turns out that, that Paul uses God's name four times to affirm that he is telling the truth. In Romans chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 8. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 23. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5. Clearly, using God's name to affirm that you are telling the truth is not contrary 
to what Jesus teaches in our passage this morning. Although naturally, we should not do this lightly or casually. God's name is too holy for that. But to understand what Jesus is saying here, we need to keep the context in mind. Jesus has been teaching about true righteousness, the true righteousness of God, in contrast to what the Pharisees teach. The Pharisees taught that if you avoiding, if you avoided committing a particular and definite act like murder or adultery, then you had fulfilled the righteousness of the law. Jesus taught that the righteousness of God is much more than that. True righteousness includes the motives and intents of the heart. When the, des the desire to harm and destroy prompts you to speak a certain way, you have committed murder. When sexual desire for a woman prompts you to look a certain way when you're married, you have committed adultery. So in the matter of swearing an oath or a vow unto God, when the same pride and arrogance that would lead you to make an empty false vow prompts you to say certain things, you have taken God's name in vain and treated God with contempt. But before I say anything more on this, let us read our text for this morning from Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. Jesus said, Again you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, Do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by, heaven, by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for sending your Son. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to the earth. We thank you for teaching us the truth and revealing the truth in your life. And we ask that you would open our hearts and minds now to see and understand and receive the truth, that we might live in the truth, that we might walk in the light, that we might be your children, your disciples, your people. Lord, we ask this. Bless us, we pray. Pray, bless your word to us, we pray. Teach us through the Spirit of God, for it is in your name we pray. Amen. Well, first we need to understand something about the false teaching of the Pharisees that Jesus is exposing here. God did indeed warn against swearing falsely. In Leviticus 19, verse 12, God said, You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. And in Deuteronomy 23, verse 21, he said, If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. As God makes clear in Psalm 116, verses 12 through 19, if you make a vow to the Lord to do something, then fulfilling that vow becomes an act of your worship. If you perform what you have vowed, you affirm that the Lord 
is truly God and you bring him glory. But since fulfilling that vow has become a part of your worship, if you break your vow, you are denying that the Lord is God and you are treating him with contempt. This would include the vows we made when we became members of Mount Airy Presbyterian Church. All this is included in the third commandment of the law. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The Pharisees taught that if you simply did not use God's name when you swore to do something, then your obligation to perform your vow was greatly reduced. And other competing obligations that you feel you must keep could easily justify your breaking your vow. It is similar to a situation in which you might ask yourself, when am I justified in telling a lie? Or, what lie am I willing to tell to make myself look good? If you find that there are a number of situations that would seem to justify telling a lie, then you should understand how the Pharisees could justify breaking their vows. According to the Pharisees, all you needed to do to stop sinning against God by breaking a vow was to stop using God's name and begin swearing by something else of lesser value than God, like heaven or the earth or Jerusalem or an al the altar. In Matthew 23, verses 18 through 22, Jesus exposes their hypocrisy by saying this, And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar, swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple, swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swell, swears by heaven, swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Well, in this morning's text, Jesus uses the same example of heaven as the throne of God to teach that they should not swear an oath or a vow at all. We need to ask, why? Well, the answer should be evident from our text. Because all such swearing and vowing is spoken in arrogance and pride. This becomes clear when Jesus tells us not to swear by our own head, or in other words, by our own life, when we do not even have the power to make one hair of our head white or black. The problem with such swearing and vowing is that people want to claim for themselves something that only God truly has. People want to claim that they themselves have the power and the authority to do something and to accomplish something in the future. Such a swear and such swearing is a way of emphasizing, emphasizing such a claim. Today we can we can find it's difficult to perceive the pride and arrogance involved in such swearing. Uh, because in our culture, people do not make a practice of swearing a vow to God. Because they do not believe in God enough to include his name in a vow that they make. And yet, people do frequently make great claims and promises that they will do something. And then they think nothing of it when they fail to follow through on their promises. This kind of thing reflects the pride and arrogance of their hearts in making such promises 
and their lack of integrity and their hypocrisy in not following through on their promises. What is worse, often they even deny that what they have promised in the past has any claim on what they do in the present. They are full of themselves and false and wicked in the sight of God. For this reason, Jesus says in verse 37, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil, or as some translations have it, from the evil one. When we say yes and when we say no, our words are not to be the words of pride and arrogance, but rather the, the words of a humble servant who says yes to what his Lord commands and no to what his Lord forbids. And when we promise that we will do something, we are to avoid vows made in our pride and instead we are to humbly rely upon the grace of God and on the power of the Holy Spirit as we demonstrate through faith in Christ that we speak with integrity by doing what we say we will and acting according to our promises. This is what James means when he says in James 5, verse 12, But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Jesus tells us not to swear and make vows because the vows we are prone to make are vows made in pride and arrogance, vows made in our own strength, which means that they are, more often than not, vows that we will break when it pleases us to do so. Because in our flesh, we live to please ourselves. Jesus says these things because we are not to live in our own strength, in the pride and arrogance of the flesh. We are to, to live by faith in Him and in the power of His Spirit. We are not to live as hypocrites, claiming that we are the followers of Christ while we follow the world by doing what is right in our own eyes. We are not to walk in the darkness and lies of the world, but in the light and truth of God. We still have in our flesh a nature that is sinful and loves the darkness of pride, hypocrisy, and lies. And yet, we have been saved by grace and have been born again to live as the children of God and as the children of the truth. Well, what does this mean for us? Well, John describes what it means in the beginning of his letter in 1 John chapter 5, verses, I mean, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. And there we read, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. 
And we are not to pretend to be what we are not. And we are not to claim to have what we do not have. And that can be difficult in our culture because the people who have, who have learned to live as if God did, did not exist have also learned to live as if truth did not exist. Our culture tells us that it is up to you to decide what truth is because the truth does not have to be the same for everyone. And re recently, this cultural phenomenon has developed further. Now it is up to you to decide what the facts are because even the facts do not have to be the same for everyone. Instead of trying to discern which facts are true, now we are prone to choose simply which facts we want to believe. About four years ago, a White House spokesperson said that there are alternative facts. To hear that seemed strange at the time. It no longer seems strange to hear something like that today. In our culture, we are told that we have power. All kinds of power. The power to decide what sex we will be. The power to decide what the truth is. The power to decide what the facts are. And the power to determine our own destiny. These have become the assumptions of our culture. And all that is spoken on the basis of these assumptions is said out of the pride and arrogance of man, of man who denies the reality of God's existence and his act of creation. All that is said on the basis of these assumptions is the same as taking God's name in vain. This is the sin of the heart that Jesus is addressing in our text this morning. Now we can understand how the world can hear the message of the gospel and, and take such offense. When we share the gospel of how Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead to become our Savior, we are exposing the blasphemy of the assumptions on which they are basing their lives. God the Creator is real. Our sin is real. The punishment of death and the condemnation of hell is real. It is the only reason the Son of God chose to die on a cross in our place. That reality is the message of the gospel. And so is the amazing truth that he so loves us that he died for us. And the confirmation of all these things revealed in the gospel are most certainly true and real. And that confirmation is found in the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and in the testimony of the Bible. And our lives as believers are also to be a testimony of the truth of the gospel. Well, how are we to do this? Well, we are to live as those who repent and believe in Jesus, as those who struggle against the same enemies that others do, against our own sin nature and against the lies of the world and of the evil one. We confess that our faith is not all that it should be, but that we are learning to walk in the light as Jesus is the light and that we are learning to walk in the truth as Jesus is the truth that we are repenting and learning to live in the confident expectation 
of his return. Because Jesus Christ is real. He really lived on earth. He really died for our sins on a cross outside the walls of Jerusalem. And he really rose from the dead and now lives in heaven. And he is really coming back to the earth as the judge of the living and the dead. And because the love of God has entered our hearts through faith, we want others to hear the truth, believe the truth, and be saved through the truth of Jesus and his cross. So we pray that we will live as those whose yes is yes and whose no is no. And that we will live as those who truly belong to Jesus Christ, the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you and thank you. You are the truth. You are risen from the dead. You did die on a cross for our sins. Our sins have been buried away in your death. We are forgiven through your cross and through your resurrection. And we are made alive because you live. Lord, we thank and praise you that these things have been testified as true in the Old Testament. We have only to look and read and find that all these things were said about you before you ever were born. Lord, we praise you. We thank you. And we ask that you would be gracious to us to teach us and empower us to live by faith and walk in the Spirit, in your love, loving our neighbor, loving you, serving you, honoring your name, living as those who live in the truth. For you, Jesus, are the truth. You are the way and you are the life. Lord, bless us, we pray, that we might be a blessing to others. For we pray in your name. Amen. Well, let's join together and sing a hymn of response more about Jesus would I know and after that let's sing praise the praise songs open the eyes of my heart and praise the father praise the son let's sing
And now let us hear God's benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen.